and the inauguration of Santa Jeremy Ono as the 15th president of the university. I'm Kim Clark. I'm with the Office of the Vice President for Communications. And I'm Gary Krenz. I'm with the Bentley Historical Library and the Judy and Stanley Frankel Detroit Observatory. Great to be with you it's great to on be this here. chilly but beautifully sunny silly, day. Yes, sunny. We, we, we like sunshine in Ann Arbor. Um, we are sitting here on the steps of the Hatcher Graduate Library and behind us is, of course, the Diag, and uh, we'll be watching the academic procession as it makes its way out of the Rackham School of Graduate Studies and heads toward us. All right. Right now we're watching a little bit of a protest behind us. It wouldn't be campus life without one. <laughs> That's right. The procession is going to be led by part of the Michigan Marching Band, and then we'll see a lot of people in academic robes, faculty, delegates from other institutions, and finally the platform party. That's right. And the, at the end, we'll see President Ono himself. Uh, right, right behind us, we have students who are lined up to do selfies with a cardboard cutout of President Ono, um, who is, uh, is very well known for his selfies on social media. Wouldn't be surprised to see a few on the pa on the way. Absolutely. And, and if you are a social media user, uh, you can follow the uh, inaugural activities on Twitter. The hashtag is umishprez15. That's prez, P-R-E-S, 15. So come on along with us. We have a. They, well, I was just going to say they're going to come down. Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry, the base. Yeah. You're looking now at the the academic mace. This is what will be carried at the front of the procession by Alan Liu, who's the chair of the faculty, um, and this will be placed on the lectern when President Ono speaks. There, you can see uh, Dr. Ono's name has already been engraved on the mace, which holds the names of all of our presidents. The mace really, though, uh, symbolizes the authority of the faculty as a whole, not just the president. The president is the symbol of the faculty, not the director of the faculty. Right. And this is a beautiful image of what's known as the 1913 lectern. It sits inside the auditorium, uh, which opened in 1913. Um, and that lectern was a gift from the class of 1913 to the university, and every president has used it at an inauguration since then. And it's been used by many, many well-known uh, people from around the country who have talked at Hill, Absolutely. spoken at Hill. Martin Luther King Jr., Eleanor Roosevelt, Julian Bond, um, a real who's who of important voices have stood at that lectern. So what's been going on today? Well, what's been going on today is we started with a flag raising uh, early this morning, and then there was a symposium, actually two separate sessions, uh, devoted to topics that uh, are of particular interest to President Ono. Uh, one is the campus community and its diversity, and the other is uh, climate change. Here we can see the procession is already making its way across Ingalls Mall. Uh, so who's who are the people who are in this procession? Like Gary said, we have uh, faculty, we have U of M faculty, but we also have scholars from universities around the state, the country, and, and around the world. Over 70 institutions actually sending delegates. Often those delegates are alumni who happen to be in Ann Arbor anyway, but often they are coming a long way to, to an event like this. Right, they are here to, to celebrate President Ono, to officially welcome him into this role, and to wish him the best as he leads the university. Yes, lots of good wishes. And here we have the marching band. Yeah. Uh, the marching band has um, been part of inaugural processions for a number of years, and really nothing gets your heart pumping like, uh, like seeing them. Um, we also have students out along the 
procession watching everything. And so we're going to cut away to Jared Wadley. He's a member of the Michigan News Service, and uh, he's got some students with him right now. And I'm from Midland, Michigan. I'm Jewel. I'm from Warren, Michigan. My name is Yusuf, and I'm from uh, Macomb, Michigan. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about what you expect or what you're looking for for the president's administration, what you would like to see. Sure thing. So there's two things I'd like to see. First, um, I'd like to see an acknowledgement of the negotiations that is happening between GEO and the university. Sometimes it seems like GEO is just um, negotiating with some like negotiator that's been hired, and I'd like to see like uh, the, the president acknowledge some of the things they're taking issue with. Um, and secondly, I'd like to see the president um, f work on the, the housing market for uh, the students. It's gotten a lot of out of whack in the last few years, and um, this uh, influence he can exert over you know the city and um, you know dorms and so on to ease that for students. All right, thank you. And then, what do you like to see uh, from the president's administration? What would you hope to see President Ono do while you're here as a student? Yes, I would like to see the 4% black community on campus acknowledged. Um, I think that he could go out on campus, speak to some of the, our black students on campus, see how they feel about it, how it affects them, and even alumni can tell them how it has affected them on their time on campus too, and also get some community input on how change can be made. All right, thank you. Now you've had a chance to meet the president. Tell me about what had happened and what you had a chance to talk to him about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I saw him last semester at a meet and greet when he had for all the students on North Campus. It was actually really well. I was able to spend a minute with him and just talk to him and actually thank him for all that he's done because I really think he's done very well in developing a sense of community at the U of M campus that was difficult to do in the past. And so I just want to thank him for that. It was really cool to meet him. He was a very nice guy. All right, thank you. And now uh, we'll send it back to Gary and Kim. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Jared. So uh, the procession is, uh, has already made its way here to the Graduate Library. They're basically making a U-turn and heading toward Hill Auditorium uh, for the ceremony. Yeah, they made the turn a little sooner because little. of the protest that was going on. Yes. And this is partly what uh, makes life at a university so exciting exactly. and interesting. Uh, they, the marching band came by. They're playing the victors. And uh, for the program itself, there'll be a lot of traditional U of M music. Uh, there'll be some classical music student performances, faculty remarks. Right. Inaugurations go back to 1852 when our first president, Henry Philip Tappan, was inaugurated. And presidents often use these occasions to celebrate the values of the institution, uh, to talk about accomplishments, and also to set a vision. And I think we'll see some of that from President Ono later this afternoon. Exactly. Uh, Santa Ono has been president of the university since mid-October. Uh, he is our 15th president. He joins us from the University of British Columbia, where he was the president for six years. Uh, interestingly, Alan Liu, who is the chair of the faculty senate, who is leading the procession today, he's a native of, of Vancouver, just like Dr. Ono is. Yeah. Um, and he earned his degree at UBC, so there's a nice tie in there. And Dr. Ono is actually our second Canadian uh, president, Harold Absol Shapiro being the first. That's right. They both have uh, degrees from McGill University. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the first uh, person of Japanese descent Absolutely. To, uh, to serve as president of the University of Michigan. Absolutely. Um, and I should add that I believe uh, Dr. Ono's parents are tuning in for the live stream today. I'm sure this is a very special moment for them. Um, and also one of their other sons, Mamoru Ono, who is a professor of piano at Creighton University, He'll be performing during the ceremony today. So Which is wonderful. There's really, a, lot, a lot of family activity. There's a lot of family ties. Inauguration. All right. Well, we're thrilled that you've been able to join us today. The ceremony is about to begin in Hill. Uh, we expect a full house in there. And uh, we'll be cutting away in there so you can see what's happening. Thank you.
सा था Welcome to the installation ceremony of Dr. Santan J. Ono, the 15th president of the University of Michigan. At this time, we ask that you rise, if you're able, for the singing of our national anthem. Good afternoon. I'm Lori McCauley, Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the University this afternoon. Please join me in thanking John Taus Foster, a senior in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and pianist Tyler Driscoll, a lecturer at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, for that moving rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you all for joining us to celebrate the inauguration of Dr. Santa J. Ono as the 15th president of the University of Michigan. As we begin, I want to recognize an important part of our history, a land transfer from the indigenous people of this area. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Badawatomi nations 
made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially through the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Today, we are here to celebrate and install a vibrant servant leader into our university's most cherished and visible position. Since before the Civil War, the president of the University of Michigan has served to guide our institution through the unfathomable complexities of our nation's tumultuous history. To read the biographies of our presidents is to soar over some choppy waters, to see the spasms of our relatively young nation as it grew, and to wonder at how far we've come today. During every major chapter in history, from world wars to the civil rights movement, from the depression to the invention of the internet, our presidents have been responsible for asking the fundamental question, how can the University of Michigan contribute to the public good in this moment? Today, I'm so proud to say, without a doubt, that we have found someone worthy to ask and answer that fundamental question. As a university, we will benefit from President Ono's richly diverse experiences. In many ways, he's a mosaic of our community itself. He was born on the west coast of Canada and raised on the east coast of the United States. But one could argue that his humble authenticity foreshadowed his ultimate arrival here in the Midwest. He's equally at home writing for a journal of immunology or writing a tweet. <laughs> He's a world-renowned expert in the science of vision and a visionary leader in higher education. He's a talented cellist and an honorary Doctor of Divinity. Of course, we expect the president of any prestigious university, and especially the University of Michigan, to have an impressive CV, and he does. That's not what has rallied people around President Ono in his first months here. I believe the secret of his impact lies in his character. Those who meet him quickly learn about his curiosity. It gives him a special gravity. He genuinely wants to learn about the university by knowing the people who live and work here. His training as a scientist is evident not just in his deductive savvy, but in his humility. When speaking with him on issues of major import, it's clear that he's a person committed to thoughtful appraisal. And perhaps most striking is his warmth. He's a compassionate person, invigorated by giving to those in need, giving his undivided attention, and giving students high fives. My fellow executive officers have been impressed with his holistic thinking, his principled approach, and his relentless drive. Yes, relentless drive. <laughs> I'm confident in saying that he is the leader we need, and he's arriving just at the right time. Thank you, President Ono, for being our leader. It's my pleasure to introduce members of the platform party, beginning with the regents of the university who are elected by the citizens of the state of Michigan. Please hold your applause until all regents have been recognized. First, Jordan B. Acker, Huntington Woods. Michael J. Beam, Grand Blanc. Mark J. Bernstein, Ann Arbor. 
Paul W. Brown, Ann Arbor, Sarah Hubbard, Okemos, Denise Illich, Bingham Farms, Ron Weiser, Ann Arbor, and Kathy White, Ann Arbor. Thank you for your service. Also with us today are former members of the Board of Regents, Paul Brown Sr. and Julia Donovan Darlow. We are also pleased to be joined by two of the university's past presidents, Mary Sue Coleman, who served from 2002 to 2014, and again in 2022. <laughs> and James J. Duderstadt, who served from 1988 to 1996. We are pleased to have the following elected officials who have joined us today, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II, <laughs> State Representative Felicia Brabeck, <laughs> Mayor of Ann Arbor Christopher Taylor, Ann Arbor City Council member Erica Briggs, <laughs> Ann Arbor City Administrator Milton Dehoney, Jr., <laughs> Ann Arbor City Council member Cynthia Harrison, <laughs> Ann Arbor City Council member Jen Ayer, and Ann Arbor City Council member Christopher Watson. We are deeply appreciative for your commitment to the university and to pu public higher education. I would also like to recognize the university's executive officers, deans, and senior administrators who provide outstanding leadership each day and members of the University of Michigan faculty, without whose scholarship and commitment to teaching, the university would not be what it is today. Thank you for being here. Our very special guests today are the delegates and representatives from nearly 50 universities and learned societies. Your participation in this ceremony symbolizes, in a highly meaningful way, the worldwide community of scholars of which this university is a part. We are honored and grateful that you have joined us. And we warmly welcome members of President Ono's family who are seated in the audience or joining us virtually, including his wife, Wendy Yip, their daughters, Juliana and Sarah, and son-in-law, David Chang, his parents, Sachiko and Tashaki Ono, and many other members of his extended family. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Victor J. Zhao. Dr. Zhao is president of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, vice chair of the National Research Council, chancellor emeritus of Duke University, and past CEO of Duke Health System. Previously, he was professor and chairman of medicine at Harvard and Stanford universities. Zhao is recognized internationally for his contributions as a scientist, administrator, and leader. Welcome, Dr. Zhao.
Thank you so much, Provost Macaulay, President Ono, distinguished Board of Regents, honored guests, faculty, and students. For me, it's a great privilege to be here for this momentous occasion, installing my good friend, Dr. Santa Ono, as the president of the University of Michigan. Now, Santa will be the 15th president, but the first Asian American to lead the University of Michigan. So you all know that Michigan is among the top universities in the U.S. and the number one public research university. Speaking for Asian Americans, we are so, so proud. You know, Santa and I have crossed our path many times in our life. I met him first at McGill, then at Harvard, when we were much younger. Of course, I'm much younger than he is. <laughs> now, here's my little brother. When I first met him, he struck me right away with his intelligence, value, and energy. As both Asian Americans, we immediately bonded. And since then, we looked out for each other, as brothers would do. So here we are today, a moment of great pride. Santa comes to Michigan with exceptional track record as a visionary leader of higher education. As you know, with previous successful tenures, as president of the University of Cincinnati, University of British Columbia. Those at his previous university have spoken about his charm, his wisdom, his ability to connect with those around him, his high fives. <clears throat> and he has been a creative problem solver, ambitious fundraiser, and someone unafraid to take bold action. The center I know is driven by his mission and values which allowed him to persevere through challenges and provide steady, compassionate guidance through difficult times, such as COVID-19. He strives to leave his community better than he found it in manners great and small. I believe Santa is the right fit for Michigan because University of Michigan's motto is Artis Sancia Veritas, or Arts, Knowledge, and Truth. And I can think of no person who's a better match for these values. Let me explain each in turn. First, artist or arts. He's not only a support of visual and performing arts, but you, do you know that he's a talented cellist, an accomplished performer? Well, you should get him here to play for you. <laughs> he joined the Cincinnati Young Artists to open for Yo-Yo Ma, 2015. And I heard Yo-Yo Ma gave him Two thumbs up. <laughs> He's been a champion of liberal arts and humanities and have referred to them as, quote, cornerstone of just societies. And he's so right. He's spoken frequently about the importance of liberal arts in developing a moral foundation that would lead to sustainable peace and progress and has strong, developed, developed strong arts and humanities program at his previous universities. Because of his leadership, I know that under his leadership, the arts and humanities will thrive at the University of Michigan. Second, censure or knowledge. Of course, you already heard, he spent many years as a productive, respected immunologist and researcher before transitional to executive leadership roles. He understands knowledge and science. He recognized the important role of university as temples of knowledge and worked tirelessly to grow knowledge as a foundational mission in each of his previous universities, expanding, creating major research education initiatives. At Cincinnati, Santa launched the UC's Neil Armstrong Science Space Institute and created an international partnership that to a new international college of medicine. And likewise, he created new schools and centers at UBC. Center recognized the importance of equity in education. His work to advance women's participation in STEM education dates back many, many years, and he has pushed for improved education access for low-income and first-generation students. While at UBC, he launched the 200 million blue and gold campaign for students who need assistance for financial aid, underrepresented groups, and international students. 
As an immigrant myself, and someone who left home several years ago, years ago, to pursue education in a new country, these efforts are especially meaningful for me, as they are for many others. Opening doors of knowledge to all those interested, regardless of their background, is essential to human progress. Finally, Veritas, or Truth. Center is devoted to pursuit of truth, both professional and personal levels. He doesn't shy away from speaking truth in addressing complex and sometimes controversial topics. For example, at UBC, he led major efforts focused on truth and reconciliation for indigenous group in Canada, acknowledging the university's role in failing to confront the history of indigenous residential school for many, many years. In 2018, he opened the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, UBC. You know, the center I know is authentic and open, and is open about his own personal journey. His honest remarks about his own mental health history have combated stigma, built acceptance, and helped countless at others. He's approachable and genuine in all his interactions, I can tell you that. It is one of the things I admire most about him, and perhaps one of the most crucial characteristics of a great leader. So importantly, across all these contributions, you hear an unwavering commitment to inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. Center will bring these values to University of Michigan, ensuring the campus is a place where people from all backgrounds can grow and thrive in a culture of safety and community. Arts, knowledge, and truth. He embodies absolutely all three. Now, before I conclude, let's not forget another passion for Michigan and for Santa, University Athletics. As you will soon learn, Santa's rarely without his bow tie. Actually, he looks unnatural without it. <laughs> However, he's also known to don a basketball, a football uniform, to do drills with the team, as you already found out. He loves to be up close on the field and on the court, and even on occasion, crowd serving in the stands. I've seen that happen. <laughs> when after Duke played University of Cincinnati in one of the bowls in football. Uh, I'm not saying Santa took this job solely because he wanted to be on the field, but I tell you, it's a great factor in your favor. <laughs> now, on that note, I want to turn last final famous Michigan alum, alum, Tom Brady. Tom remarked on his time at Michigan that once he got an opportunity to start, he wasn't ever going to be taken off the field. Well, Tom Beatty may have retired. We shall see. <laughs> but Michigan just got its next MVP. Santa has the same drive and commitment to the suc success of his team. Once you put him in blue and maize of Michigan, he's not going to hold back. He's going to make a big difference. He'll be a Wolverine for life. So Santa, here's to you, my friend, on your commendable achievement University of Michigan and entire academic community is lucky to have you as leader. And to Michigan, here's to you as well. Congratulations on this momentous day. Let's go blue. I'm delighted and deeply honored to represent the faculty of the University of Michigan uh, from the Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn campuses in the inauguration of President Ono. My name is Alan Liu. I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, and biophysics, and the chair of the faculty senate. This is a historic moment for our university and also a special moment for me. Prior to coming to Michigan, President Ono was the president of my alma mater, the University of British Columbia. He brought the love for UBC to Michigan, an institution that we all deeply love and care about. In just a few short months, President Ono has set the tone for the university with a focus and advocacy on climate, anti-racism, and mental health. These are pressing issues that our society faces. I'm confident that under President Ono's leadership, we'll grow and prosper as an institution. On behalf of the faculty, I want to once again give my warmest welcome to President Ono, and we look forward to having a positive and collaborative relationship with President Ono for many years to come. <laughs> A 
It is an honor to introduce poet Karina Duan, an important voice in contemporary American poetry. Karina received her undergraduate degree from Michigan, and she's currently studying her doctorate as part of our joint English education program. Her two acclaimed poetry collections, I Wore My Blackest Hair and Alien Miss, explore identity, language, and the daily details that make life meaningful. We're delighted to have an opportunity to hear a poem from Karina written for today's ceremony. Thank you so much, Professor Leo, for the kind introduction. The poem that I'll be sharing today is titled, Where the Light Falls In, inspired by our campus community and written in celebration of President Ono's inauguration. Where the light falls in. Daily, here go the rhythms of our world again. Magnolia branch, sneaker on pavement, courtyard grass still holding memory of frost and winter boot. Every day, see where the light falls in. Through another open window, through a lecture hall where you might say, study the physics of music or the moon's many craters, how gravity pulls on water to make tides below. Listen, every day here, one of us sweeps the floors or serves our meals or memorizes a slow walk to class, wandering this way, then that, to find a starry maple leaf, or watch the marching band coax brass instruments into shiny song. Every day here, we find each other in the patterned wave of shadow and sound through classrooms or in community gardens or stadiums adrift with maize and Huron River blue. There go the bicycle wheels and the brazen squirrels fattened by acorns and a passerby's generous hand. There go the compost bins and the bell tower chimes and the athletes moving like bodies of water, basketballs like perfect gold moons balanced on hips. See the curtains parting to reveal one of us mid sawn or erasing the whiteboard or opening the soft cover of a library book to admire its silver spine. See the clouds lifting to reveal one of us steady at the microscope or taking notes in the student newsroom or in the kitchen, frying circles of onion in paths of golden butter. See the light come to rest. In Dearborn, Flint, Ann Arbor, we who organize and laugh and clean and lift and live and praise and hold and pulse and pause and dance and make and make and neighbor alongside our beloved communities and see our past, a thread always woven into our future. Today, the light falls in casts itself across centuries onto a river floor, then winds itself towards a campus diag, travels beneath piano keys and up staircases, beside tree roots and through windows of stained glass. The light drapes itself, rosy-like, in auditoriums and in gyms, in classrooms and in dining halls, landing upon the shoulders of a university's 15th president, reaching all of us as we open the archives to remap and renew and restory and begin, begin again. Thank you. Thank you, Carlina. That was a lovely and moving poem. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Lieutenant Governor of Michigan, Garland Gilchrist II. A proud alum of the University of Michigan, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist has dedicated his career to solving problems. An engineer by training, he's dedicated to using a thoughtful and fact-based approach to solve real problems and make government work better for Michigan families. 
As part of the Whitmer administration, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist has focused on helping Michiganders in communities across our state realize their full economic and political potential. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. Good afternoon, everyone. This is, I love a responsive audience. This is a momentous occasion and a very important celebration, not just for the University of Michigan, but for the state of Michigan. So I want to thank the university, its leadership, this entire community for welcoming me to say congratulations and welcome, President Ono, you and your family, for your commitment to serving this community and this institution. I want to thank the University of Michigan Board of Regents, the faculty, the staff, the executive leadership, administrators, students, delegates who are visiting, family, and friends. Again, it is such an honor to be here. And while I'm here as the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Michigan, the more important role that I play here is as a proud Wolverine. See, I graduated from the College of Engineering in 2005 with degrees in computer engineering and computer science. And I had all of the, well, as normal as engineering experiences can be for any engineering students in the room. I pulled many an all-nighter at what was then known as the Media Union President Duderstadt, but is now, of course, the Duderstadt Center. BTB's, Pizza House, student organizations, watching every sports team from every student section. And I had an amazing time, and I lived on every part of campus. And I think of those times and those days and those nights every day. In fact, it helped shape and sharpen me into the person and public servant that I am today. Because here in this environment was where I learned to ask questions. I asked new questions that pushed the limits of my vision and my understanding. It's here where I began my journey as a leader, responding to discrimination via collective action. It's here where I met new people and understood my potential and envisioned what my life could be. That was because this university was a safe place for a black kid from the east side of Detroit to call home. The University of Michigan has played the same role and continues to play that role for countless Wolverines. And just as it fostered growth for me, it breeds innovation and creativity amongst all to whom it encounters. It opened doors for me in the same way that it opens the doors to discovery, imagination, and possibility that's brought forth through science and research. And just as it has empowered me, it empowers everyone to reach their full potential. It prepares students, as it has for nearly 200 years, to solve problems and to change the world. Now the mission that we all collectively must strive toward is even more important considering the challenges that we face as a collection of communities. Inequities in income, education, health that lower life expectancy and worsen outcomes and stifle economic well-being. Attacks on our democracy and a lack of economic opportunity and the existential crisis of climate change the chorus of voices that may call on us to give up. But this University of Michigan is nothing if not a place where people come to respond to cynicism with sincerity and despair with determination. That embodies who we are as Michiganders. Bold problem solvers who are not afraid to think outside of every box. Empathetic leaders who never forget where we come from, striving to make a difference 
for the communities and the people we serve. Difference makers who reject the fiction of impossibility. Our communities, our state, our nation and our world need us to be the leaders and best. And thank God we have President Ono here to be our leader and our best. President Ono, as you take your office, your mission and your challenge is to serve and prepare young people who will make and define the Michigan difference. It is to carry forward the mission of this university and feed the flame of education that shines a light on our path forward. Yes, challenges will come, and they can be overcome by taking inspiration from our values that ground us and guide our thoughts and actions. I know that you will hold this mission close to your heart as you embark upon your time as the president of the University of Michigan. And know that my partner in public service, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, myself and the entire state of Michigan are rooting for your success. So thank you, God bless you, and go blue. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. I now have the pleasure of introducing University of Chicago President Emerita Hannah Holborn Gray. Born in Germany, she escaped with her family to the U.S. after the Nazi regime came to power. Years later, President George H.W. Bush presented her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award for her contributions to her adopted homeland. President Emerita Gray served as the provost at Yale University before being promoted to acting president, the first woman to hold this position. She was then selected president of the University of Chicago, the first woman to serve as its chief executive, where she led the institution for 15 years. She's the recipient of more than 70 honorary degrees from a wide variety of higher education institutions. Welcome, President Emerita Gray. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Ono, it is just short of 39 years since I conferred your bachelor's degree. <laughs> and welcomed you as an alumnus of the University of Chicago. And today again, we can think of as a commencement, if of a different order considering that you've now become the guy who gives out the degrees <laughs> and who welcomes their recipients. Today we are gathered instead to welcome and celebrate the commencement of your leadership, already well established in this great university. It is an occasion that holds meaning for the larger academic world as well, for each of its institutions' well-being is critical to the flourishing of all. Michigan and Chicago have long shared a special relationship. As an undergraduate center, you were probably aware that this connection was once fiercely competitive, driven by intercollegiate sport. The annual football game between the two rivals was regarded as the national championship you might have bought, when you were an undergraduate, you might even have worn a t-shirt that lists the many triumphant years in which Chicago, yes, Chicago, <laughs> dominated the Big Ten. You may not, however, have been told the outcome of the last game played between the two teams. So I will somewhat reluctantly share it with you. 
the scoreboard read Michigan 85, <laughs> Chicago 0. <laughs> and two months later, Chicago announced it was leaving big time. <laughs> And at the time, the president there remarked that if he had not acted, the Humane Society <laughs> would have had to be called in to bring a merciful end to what had become an obvious mismatch. I know, Santa, that yours is a kind heart and that you will always refrain from mentioning that score in the cafes of Ann Arbor. And in return, we will not go on proclaiming Chicago's vanished glories on the streets of Hyde Park. Each of our institutions has chosen the path in sports best fitted to its own circumstances and its own history. And that is as it should be, as today we walk together in peaceful solidarity. For when it comes to what matters most, the central mission of our universities we are the closest of partners, united in our goals and in our responsibilities to the common purpose of the discovery, sustenance, and dissemination of knowledge in the search for freedom and understanding in democratic and pluralistic culture. The world of higher education is struggling today with a widespread sense of crisis a time of questioning and sharpened conflict over the quality and cost and performance of its institutions, of doubt as to whether higher education is doing its job, uncertainty as to what that job should in fact be and how it should be accomplished, a waning respect and declining faith in their capacity to make good on their promises, has driven a focus almost and ridiculously in my opinion, negative on the problems and shortcomings of higher education. Concluding in prognoses that imagine, as I heard once a burnt out baseball manager say, that the future is just like the present, only longer. <laughs> to push against an outlook so devastating, to assert the positive strengths and accomplishments that are indeed at work, and on which to build into a different future. That, Santa, is the task before you. You understand the current problems very well, and you will confront them, as you have always done, with determination and openness, with patience and courage, consulting widely and wisely to reach solutions that will command respect. Perhaps not always unanimous agreement. This is, after all, a university. And a, and a university, by definition, is a place to argue about anything and everything. There are probably people out there today arguing about whether or not the sun is shining. And that is your charge, to stimulate the greatest range of discussion in an environment of the greatest possible freedom for its members and the greatest possible protection and freedom from ideological and partisan pressures and distortions. Yours is the work of helping lead beyond the present discontents to a future which it is ultimately the goal of education and learning to help to shape. That next future will depend on the new disciplines and styles of learning, the directions of new ideas and discoveries, the educated minds and imaginations that find inspiration in the leadership of the university. And, that find, and those find inspiration, too, in the joys and the satisfactions of the higher learning. The president's role is best understood as one of service. It helps give substance to the power of learning by enabling and empowering others to do their best work to be their most independent-minded selves, and to pursue their deepest interests wherever they may lead. I can think of no vocation that can create more satisfaction and joy. 
when freely shared and guided by seriousness of purpose, joined to a humanity of spirit that shares and conveys both pleasure and confidence in the worth of the university's cause. President Ono has arrived at a critical moment for higher education, a time that calls for powerful advocacy in its cause and a restored confidence on which to build higher learning's contributions to the public good. It is a time that calls for unwavering commitment to the principled pursuit of the university's best purposes. And we can predict right here, right now, that as a well-tested and high-performing quarterback, Santa will be calling the plays and winning those challenges by the widest possible margins. We will be cheering from the sidelines, from the, excuse me, from the stands, Santa, and wishing you not only great success, but also great joy and genuine fulfillment. Congratulations again to you and to your university. Thank you. Thank you, President Emerita Gray. I now have the honor of introducing Dr. Mamoro Ono and Professor Arthur Green, who will perform Mozart's Sonata for piano, four hands in D major. Dr. Ono is a celebrated musician who has played with the Baltimore Symphony and the Pittsburgh Symphony and currently teaches at Creighton University. He's proud to be here in support of President Ono, who is his brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Arthur Green has played recitals in many international venues, including Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, and Moscow Rachmaninoff Hall. Green has been on the faculty at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance since 1990 and has won the Harold Haw Award for Excellence in Studio Teaching. Please enjoy this performance by Dr. Ono and Professor Green.
Mr. President, members of the Board of Regents, honored platform guests, and all in attendance, whether in person or virtually, good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to speak. I regret that I am not able to be there in person, but I am honored to have been asked by President Ono to say a few words. As some of you know, President Ono and I have a relationship that goes back more than 15 years. He once worked for me, and now I get to work for him. That seems fitting somehow. What most of you may not know is Santa and I first became acquainted when he interviewed to fill a decanal role at Emory that I determined did not fit his then skill set or experiences. Yet, I saw something in him, which led me to create a new office and a completely different job for him. From this position, Senior Vice Provost for Undergraduate Affairs, Santa went on to become first provost and then president of the University of Cincinnati, and then the president of the University of British Columbia before becoming the president of the University of Michigan. I recount this star to underscore three points. Academic leaders are trained at the graduate level to become experts in their fields. We go on to head complex organizations because someone saw something in us and entrusted us with the opportunity to lead. Once entrusted, we learn that we serve as rather than we are. Santa is the 15th president of this great university Others will follow as certainly as others preceded. It is in service too that we make the greatest difference. And in serving, we get to set an agenda. Since October, you have gleaned a bit about President Ono's priorities, especially with respect to the environment and inclusion. But you should also know he cares about scholarly expertise, even as he knows today's problems require new teams of interdisciplinary experts working in concert to tackle bold challenges. In a short while, you will hear more about those priorities. No leader, regardless of how skilled, succeeds without the engaged commitment of a community. In this age, a president must be an effective communicator, a skilled strategist, an able tactician, and a fierce advocate. They must be empathetic and decisive, humane and equitable, forward-looking and a student of the past. They must also know the importance of courting help and securing advice, and they need to have mastered the art and science of engagement. Today, I call on the University of Michigan community to engage, to challenge when called for, to support when necessary, to advance always, to care deeply, and to believe in the power of this great institution to transform lives and thereby the world. President Ono, Santa, welcome to Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan. You have our support, we have your back, and together we will energize the phrase, leaders and best. It's always a special gift to hear from Earl Lewis. His remarks were as warm and wise as I would expect. Earl is a noted historian who's dedicated to exploring society's major questions at the University of Michigan Center for Social Solutions. He is also an award-winning author, president emeritus of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and a former provost of Emory University. His perspective is consistently heartening. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the inauguration cello choir, prepared by Professor of Cello Richard L. Aaron and featuring Juliet Schleifer, Master of Music and Voice Performance. They will be performing Bacchianus Brasileiras Number no. 5, composed by Ator Villa Lobus. Enjoy the performance. Thank you. 
Absolutely beautiful, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Paul W. Brown, Chair of the University of Michigan Board of Regents, to initiate the installation of our president. Wow, uh, I was not an English major, but I'm pretty sure that is the definition of a hard act to follow. <laughs> Dean, Dean Curzan, am I right? Is that literally the definition? I thought so. Well, this is an important day for a very important institution, but it's also an exciting day. Uh, I know it's exciting for me to walk into this great hall to the victors being played by the greatest marching band in the world. But it was also exciting to walk into this great hall to the protest chants of some of the greatest students and teachers in the world. When, when we were walking in, uh, Regent Acker turned to me and said, the Michigan marching band playing the victors next to students protesting, if that isn't Michigan, I don't know what is. <laughs> And it is, that was great. And that's one of the things that makes this university so great. And that is why it is my honor to lead the installation ceremony for the University of Michigan's 15th president, Dr. Santa Ono. In 1817, the founders of our state established the University of Michigan as a distinctly public institution with the sole purpose of serving the public good. In the 206 years, the people of Michigan has entrusted the presidency of this university to only 14 men and women. We, the Board of Regents, have appointed Dr. Ono by unanimous consent. We have done this because we believe he exemplifies leadership for the public good. As you know, Dr. Ono is the former president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia. He is also an internationally esteemed scholar of immunology and vision research. It can be said that his academic expertise is a metaphor for the qualities he brings to our beloved university. Qualities that make him ideally suited at this point in time to lead Michigan for the public good. As a strong human immune systems keep uh, individual healthy, Dr. Ono will fortify and expand Michigan's health and well-being in scholarly prowess in public service and its commitment to equity and accessibility. Dr. Ono is a visionary leader. He sees clearly. He has a vision for the University of Michigan that is compelling, comprehensive, and dynamic. He already sees what we can become. When Michigan students, faculty, staff, and alumni inform the Presidential Search Committee of the qualities most sought after in our 15th president, they were trust, integrity, emotional intelligence, and the ability to engage with all members of the Michigan family. You possess these qualities, Dr. Ono, and so many more. Your leadership and vision will enrich the fabric of our collective being, affirm our contributions to the public good, and chart our course for excellence in all our endeavors. So now, with firm conviction, I am pleased to invite my fellow regents to rise and for Dr. Ono to join me. The Constitution of the State of Michigan, in Article 8, Section 5, establishes a body corporate known as the Regents of the University of Michigan. One of the duties prescribed for the Regents is the election of the President, the Principal Executive Officer of the University. In July 2022, the Board of Regents elected Santa J. Ono to be the President of this University. This ceremony formally installs him in that office. By the authority vested in us 
by the people of the state of Michigan. We, the duly elected regents of the University of Michigan, do hereby install you, Santa J. Ono, as the 15th president of the University of Michigan on this, the seventh day of March, 2023. We pledge our faithful efforts to join with you and your colleagues in advancing the great works of this university. Through teaching to increase the knowledge and wisdom of our students, through research to push forward the frontiers of what is known and understood to maintain academic freedom, and thus serve the citizens of Michigan, this nation, and the world. On behalf of the entire Board of Regents, I congratulate you, President Ono. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to invite President Ono to address the audience. Thank you very much, everyone. It's wonderful to be here in this absolutely stunning Hill Auditorium. Paul, all of the regents, thank you so much for this high honor to serve the greatest university in the world, the University of Michigan. Thank you all for joining us, whether online or in this magnificent auditorium. Thank you again, all of you, for this opportunity and for your faith in me. It is a singular honor and privilege to be inaugurated today to serve as the University of Michigan's 15th president. I would also like to thank our distinguished guests and speakers for joining us. We've had a chance to hear from them. They're remarkable people. Michigan's Lieutenant Governor, Garland Gilchrist, an engineer by training and a problem solver by vocation, but a proud Michigander and a proud Wolverine. Let's hear it for him. And you heard from Victor Zhao, He's an iconic figure in medicine and in science. He's a leader who serves as the president of the National Academy of Medicine of the United States of America. I've been lucky to come to know Victor over the past 15 years. I've looked up to him every step of the way. As you know, we were both educated at McGill University in Montreal and we both worked at Harvard, and I looked up to him, as I said, as a great scientist, a great healer, someone who knows how to build institutions. Victor, thank you so much for being here today. And of course, Hannah Holborn Gray, a trailblazer, a great academic, someone whose advice and counsel is thought, sought after all around the world, President Emerita of the University of Chicago, an exceptional president and a truly inspiring model of leadership. As you heard, Hannah signed my undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago in 1984. 
Thank you, Hannah, for being here. And Alan Liu, Professor Alan Liu, even more important than being the chair of the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, Alan is a fellow Vancouverite, a Canadian, and he earned his undergraduate degree from none other than the University of British Columbia. And for all of you watching from UBC, thank you for a remarkable almost seven years serving as your president. What a wonderful institution. I shall always be proud to have been associated with UBC. Let's hear it for UBC. And what can I say about my mentor, Earl Lewis, someone who is known throughout this campus, but also around the world. My mentor and my guide, and one of the most outstanding people I know on this planet. As you heard from him, he gave me the high gift of trust at Emory University, and as you heard, he created an office around me. I was the first ever senior vice provost for undergraduate education. And in doing so, he launched my career in administration. I continue to rely on his wisdom and counsel today. I would not be here were it not for Earl, and therefore, I would not be here were it not for the University of Michigan. Let's hear it for Earl. Now, you've had a chance to hear from my partner in academic leadership. Those of you know, who know how universities run know that every president needs a great provost. And we have one here in Provost Lori McCauley. I am so grateful for even the past only four and a half months of what is clear about who she is to the core, her selfless service, her dedication to this university, her steadfast, calm, collected, inspired, strategic leadership. And I'm so glad that we will be serving the University of Michigan together for many years to come. This is a time for us to all work together for stability, and for bold steps forward. Both of us benefit from our immediate predecessor, who is on the platform party, President Emerita Mary Sue Coleman. Let's hear it for her. I can't find the words to express my, really our, gratitude to Mary Sue. Twelve years of service to this institution, and she came back, and she handed the baton to me. I couldn't think of a better guide for a university president. This, my dream job, as she is perhaps one of the greatest university presidents of any institution of our time. I also want to acknowledge the members of our leadership team, including our chancellors, our vice presidents, and our deans. <laughs> Let's hear it for them, the deans. You know, I said to the deans, you're going to see a lot more of me than a typical president. You agree that's the case, right? Yeah. We travel together to California. We get together to talk about the importance of research. We talk about how to bring faculty and students together to solve the most vexing problems of the world, like climate change. It's a privilege. This group of deans is simply outstanding. I've been impressed with your dedication your ability, and I am so grateful to all of you. 
And I'd also like to welcome members of our staff, our faculty from not only Ann Arbor, but Flint and Dearborn. Let's hear it for our staff and faculty. You see, before I came here, some of you may know that the University of Michigan is considered to be a spawning ground for talent. Everywhere you look, whether you look in the Ivy League or the Big Ten or even the SEC, you will see people that were trained at the University of Michigan. I could not imagine serving with a more committed and outstanding and talented team. Let's hear it for them once again. But first and foremost, I met some of you out there. I wanted to thank our students, those of you who have joined us. It is because of you, it is your energy, your passion, your intellect and confidence that will see this institution and this nation and this world to better days ahead. Let's hear it for our students. Finally, I want to say something about my family, whose love and support of me over my lifetime has been foundational to anything that I have achieved. Some of you know that my parents, Takashi and Sachiko, immigrated from Japan shortly after the Second World War. Not a penny to their name, all their belongings in a single suitcase. My father, Takashi, was a freshly minted PhD graduate, graduating from Tokyo University and then receiving his PhD from Nagoya, Nagoya University. And he had been invited by a renowned mathematician, Andre Veille, and the then director of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, Robert Oppenheimer, to be among a select group of talented young mathematicians from Japan to be invited to be visiting members of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. For those of you who know mathematics and physics, considered a mecca for pure mathematics and theoretical physics. My parents gave birth to my brother Momoro, who you just heard, in Tokyo, Japan. And I was born in Vancouver, where my father was an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia. My younger brother, who's here, I think, over there. Over there? Where are you? Where? Over there. <laughs> where are you? Are you there? Please stand up, Ken. This is my brother, Ken Ono. Ken was born in Philadelphia when my father was professor of mathematics at the University of Pennsylvania. Throughout my entire life, I've been inspired by the accomplishments of my grandparents, my parents, and my brothers. My brother is a leading mathematician, currently working in the provost office at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And as you know, both Memoro and Ken are at the top of their fields in music and mathematics. And as you heard, Memoro is a professor of piano at Creighton University, and Ken is a professor of mathematics at UVA. And now my parents, although they cannot be with us today, I know that they're watching via live stream. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for everything. I love you very much. And above everything else, I want to express my gratitude to my own family. Wendy has been the rock of my life since we were married in 1989, and I'm grateful for her enduring support of me. People say that being a university president is a challenging occupation, 
But anyone who is, has been a university president can tell you that being a partner or spouse of a university president is 10 times more difficult. <laughs> Let's hear it for Wendy. And of course, I don't know where they are, but the apples of my eye, my two daughters, Juliana and Sarah, who have made me so proud from the, from the days they were born to today. Let's hear it for Juliana and Sarah. Where are you? Please stand up. So to Wendy, Juliana, Sarah, my son-in-law, David, and our puppy, Romeo. <laughs> and if you know, any of you know me from my Cincinnati days, I used to end graduation with a song lyric. This is going to date me, but as Debbie Boone said, you light up my life, you give me hope to carry on, you light up my days and fill my nights with song. Let's hear it from my family. Now, I was with Victor and, and some others, and they said, there are a lot of University of Chicago people here. And a number of them, I could see them right there, and there are other ones. They were my classmates, and we all got our degrees from Hannah Holber and Gray. Thank you, my friends, for being with me for all these years, supporting me, encouraging me. You mean more to me than you can even imagine. Let's hear it for the University of Chicago students. Let me, I cannot resist being on camera to say that Meat House beat Chamberlain in football. <laughs> That's an inside joke, guys. As we open this new chapter in the history of the University of Michigan, let us begin by looking back to our beginnings. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 declared, in the words inscribed on the parapet above the beautiful Angel Hall, religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. That document led to our founding in 1817 by Judge Augustus Woodward, Father Gabriel Richard and Reverend John Monteith. And as our campus grew and evolved, our ethos became one of providing an uncommon education for the common person. And our aspiration of elevating society by lifting the distinct, ineffable potential of each individual, no matter their background, color, or creed. To be certain, we have had our shortfallings as an institution, as all have. And we will face them honestly, always walking with respect and humility. Let us remember it was on this stage, behind this lectern, that Martin Luther King spoke in 1962 before giving his I Have a Dream speech. That's a piece of history that commits us to continuing that work moving forward. Today, let us be united around that same mission and purpose, the same commitment to inclusion and excellence discovery, and integrity. Today, we have exceptional programs in science and engineering, law, medicine, business, and the arts, the social sciences, and the humanities. And let me say, as I've said, from the corner of this continent to the other side, the liberal arts are crucially important for the development of critical thinking. They are more important today than ever before. Don't you agree? <laughs> 
Today, we are proudly, proudly a public university, still aspiring to be welcoming to all, inclusive of all, exceptional for all, and come an uncommon education for the common per person. Now, there are challenges that we face. Today, I submit that the world needs the University of Michigan more than ever before. For everywhere we look, we see a world in distress, with tensions rising and conflicts raging. Abroad, we face a fundamental challenge between democracies and autocracies, even as the bloody hands of tyrants are set against innocence, aspiring to basic rights and dignities. At home, we see a challenge between pluralism and zealotry, between the shrill cry of political tribalism and partisanship and the quiet call of civic engagement and citizenship. Even today, we are wrestling with racism and inequity and injustice. And as heirs to the unfinished work of Martin Luther King Jr., we cannot, we will not falter in that task and responsibility. We're all also grappling with the long-term impacts of the COVID crisis, even as we prepare for the next pandemic. Above all, we must address the climate emergency. Our planet is growing warmer and warmer. Our natural environment is deteriorating, and none of us is immune from its devastating impacts. The climate crisis is the existential challenge of our time. We know that the world is searching for solutions. And I can tell you, I already have engaged with the deans and many leaders of institutes of this institution, and they have come back to me yesterday with an exciting and bold vision of how the world can look to the University of Michigan to confront this existential challenge. Thank you for your leadership to the deans and the heads and directors of this university. Let's hear it for them. Challenges notwithstanding, let's remember that we are here to find solutions. For it was here on the steps of the Michigan Union that the Senator John F. Kennedy gave the speech that inspired the world and launched the Peace Corps. Since then, nearly 3,000 University of Michigan alumni have volunteered to change lives around the world through public service. Today, through our Ford School, we are showing that collaboration and partnership are a better solution than anger and conflict. To give just one example, Luke Schaefer, the school's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, had a critical role in the expansion of the child tax credit in 2021, which has received support from both sides of the aisle and has been hailed as one of the most successful anti-poverty measures ever signed into law. Thanks to its multifaceted expertise, impact, and policy reach, the Ford School, named after Gerald Ford, remains a leader in domestic and international policy education and a leading hub for engagement with the foreign policy community. Yet, as we look to solutions abroad, we must acknowledge that we still have challenges at home. Racism is one of America's original sins. And the University of Michigan has not been immune from participating in racism. We have excluded and segregated individuals because of their race or their gender, ethnicity, religious faith, or sexual orientation. In doing so, if you think about it, we have robbed those individuals and our university and our world of their incredible talent and potential. We must not do it again. 
our nation is searching for a better way to deliver on the promises of justice, inclusion, and diversity. So let us join hands together here at the University of Michigan. And let us remember that previous University of Michigan presidents, like Lee Bollinger, Jim Duderstadt, and Mary Sue Coleman set an example by going to the Supreme Court to defend admissions policies intended to achieve a more diverse student body. We salute them. Let's give them a round of applause. And we will not waver as an institution. We have embarked on an inclusive history project, which is being led by professors Earl Elizabeth Cole and Earl Lewis. This process of self-discovery will sometimes be difficult, painful, but it is cru crucial. For in acknowledging our past in a truthful way, with clear eyes, in plain sight, we can better move forward together with a firm step for true equity and inclusion. In January, we released the results of our DEI 1.0 initiative, which made it clear that while we have made progress, and we have, that we still have much more to do. So as we look to DEI 2.0, let us strive to nurture thoughtful and understanding citizens and further establish campuses and communities where each individual can live in peace and safety and can learn and grow and thrive and in turn give back to their families, their neighborhoods, the nation and the world. As we do so, we must also address the current and future threat of pandemics. Across history, they have shaken societies and destroyed untold lives we have seen it happen in front of our own eyes over the past several years. Yet here too, the University of Michigan has an almost unparalleled track record to provide solutions. In the early 1940s, two outstanding University of Michigan public health physicians, Thomas Francis Jr. and his young mentee, Jonas Salk, isolated some of the first strains of influenza and developed the first flu vaccine. Several years later, Salk developed a vaccine against the dreaded polio virus, and Francis, here at the University of Michigan, led the clinical trials that pr proved that the vaccine was self safe and effective. Within a decade of their announcement in 1955, polio was eliminated from this country, and eventually most of the world. That is the reach. That is the impact of this great institution. And we can do it again. Against the unremitting rise of new diseases, we continue as faculty and students to discover, innovate, explore, adapt, and heal those who are sick. In 1999, we established, under the leadership of Mary Sue Coleman, the Life Sciences Institute, which was designed to foster interdisciplinary research and creative risk-taking and strengthen the connections across our world-class life sciences community and other sciences that could strengthen and synergize with that expertise to provide the solutions that we need. So capably led now by Dr. Roger Cohn. And through our Biosciences Initiative, we are building today on University of Michigan strengths in the areas of biosciences that will have a global impact. Today, our staff at Michigan Medicine continues to serve patients and their loved ones with relentless compassion and excellence. And as we attend to the physical health of our community, we must also support their full wellness as individuals. The students that we love, Generation Z, is facing a wave of anxiety and de depression disorders, partially because of the pandemic. 
It's a challenge our students, staff, and faculty face every day. I understand. That's why I'm so pleased that the University of Michigan was one of the first American schools to adopt the Okanagan Charter, which commits us as an institution to promoting the health and well-being of each person across our three campuses. We've also established the Well-Being Collective, which takes a holistic approach to the development and wellness of the whole person, and in turn, the whole community. Student health and well-being will be, is, one of my highest priorities as president of the University of Michigan. So let us walk together towards wellness and wholeness at Michigan. Finally, we must address that most vexing existential challenge of the time, the climate emergency. Here as well, University of Michigan has long been in the lead and is poised to lead even further. In 1881, we became the first U.S. university to offer classes in forestry. And we know that understanding the impact of climate change on forests, the importance of biodiversity in being one powerful force in mitigating climate change is going to be important. Over time, it became our School of Environment and Sustainability, which today is a leader in environmental education, research, and action. Across the institution, we have over 750 faculty focused on the climate emergency. We are building on initiatives to spur multidisciplinary innovations towards climate action, like the Graham Sustainability Institute, the Institute for Energy Solutions, MI Hydrogen, and the Carbon Neutrality Acceleration Program. As we work towards carbon neutrality on all three campuses, Michigan Medicine, and athletics. We will procure 100% of our purchased electricity from renewable sources by 2025, and we will eliminate all of our greenhouse gas emissions from direct campus sources by 2040. This is an emergency, and we will step up our efforts. We are and we will continue to incorporate carbon neutrality into our new building projects and by engaging with communities to ensure that our strategies are just and equitable. We're seeking extensive on-campus solar power installations, one of the largest of any institution in the United States, and collaborating closely in this effort with the city of Ann Arbor. And we are grateful to have a great mayor of Ann Arbor. Today, we are in the midst of a national search for a sustainability leader. And we're developing a university-wide structure designed to elevate and unite sustainability scholarship, teaching, and community engagement, because all of that will be necessary for us to solve this existential challenge. Our world is facing the fiery challenge of our time as well as others ranging from aging populations to the ongoing rise of increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence. Together, let us find solutions to these challenges, just like the University of Michigan has done for centuries. Let us transform our excellence into action and impact. And let us create a brighter, stronger, and more vibrant university one dedicated to egalitarian excellence in service to humanity and better prepared and positioned to educate tomorrow's leaders who are our students today. I trust that each student who graduates from this exceptional university, whether this year or 10 years hence, 25 years from now, 
I hope that they will have a deep sense of gratitude for the education that they have received, as well as a profound understanding of the responsibility that comes with that education, and a lifelong commitment to leverage their learning to make a difference in society and in service to others. Let us make that the raison d'etre of University of Michigan. So let us build that university together. For at University of Michigan, we have an unparalleled capacity to connect. And we must connect now as never before. We have world-leading experts, exceptional graduate programs, incredible strengths in interdisciplinary studies. We also have an outstanding diversity of talented students, each with unique perspectives and talents and the high confidence that we can change the world. I have no doubt we can and we will if we do so together by building bridges. I aspire to see us become even more interdisciplinary even more interconnected than we are. And I can tell you in speaking to the deans and heads and directors, they share that passion and that goal. Today, we have an incredible range of multidisciplinary efforts and programs, ranging from our recently announced arts initiative, to our Center for RNA Biomedicine, to our Space Institute. But we can build on those efforts, connecting in new ways across academic boundaries and opening new horizons. We must also come closer together across our campuses, strengthening the bonds between Flint, Dearborn, and Ann Arbor, and building deeper connections to centers across our state, such as the Sparrow Health System in Lansing, and the University of Michigan Center for Innovation in Detroit, where we will break ground this year. As we come closer together as a university, we must also come together as a state, a nation, and a global community. We heard from Janet Napolitano earlier today. Our leadership now of the University Climate Change Coalition, our partnerships with the AAU universities, the U7 Plus Alliance of World Universities and others, to say nothing of our research engagement with a vast range of federal agencies, these are all essentials yet we can do so much more together. For that reason, we have embarked on a strategic visioning process, one designed to sharpen our impact and determine who we are as a university, what we stand for, where we want to go, where we want to play, and what we aspire to achieve as a great public university. Over this next several months, our entire university community will engage, is already engaging in a collective process to imagine our future and chart our course ahead. This, wish, this vision will be about what we can do, what we aspire to do together. As I said, it's so crucial that we do so now. If we look at history, Universities typically evolve and change gradually. It is often a deliberate, considered pace that universities add new infrastructure, hire new staff and faculty. But if you look at that history, as is described very eloquently in President Duderstadt's book, At the Helm, universities may also go through periods of sudden, rapid change through a punctuated equilibrium that opens new horizons and sets them on a decisive new trajectory. 
To give a few examples, if you look back to 1854, President Henry Tappan had a vision of creating here at the University of Michigan one of the first true American research universities. That vision was followed with decisive action. The installation of the third largest refracting telescope in the world at what's now called the Detroit Observatory, now surrounded by medical buildings of Michigan medicine. And the recruitment at that time of University of Michigan's first PhD faculty member, Franz Brunov, to use it for research and education. It was a bold vision, a bold recruitment, and a bold investment in new facilities. Astronomers used that telescope to make numerous discoveries, and they established the University of Michigan as a leading research university, not just in that field, but it attracted serious scholars in many other disciplines. It drew other outstanding researchers, even as many of our students went on to become among astronomy's leading lights. President James Angel then framed the University of Michigan as an institution, as a champion for academic freedom, committed to inclusiveness and dedicated to the service of democracy. President Marion Burton, after whom the Burton Tower just outside is named, then transformed our central campus with the first campus plan. And years later, President Harold Shapiro, also a McGill graduate, developed a strategic vision which reanimated our pursuit of excellence. His work of renewal and revitalization was continued and strengthened when he hired none other than James Duderstadt, provost at the time and dean of engineering, and developed a vision focused on three elements, knowledge, globalization, and pluralism, further shaping the campus we know today and moving to what we now know as North Campus. Friends, I say today, it is time for a new vision, a new punctuation, a new opening of possibilities for the University of Michigan. It is a time to dare great challenges and to dream bold dreams. And as we envision, imagine, and aspire, we will also build. Concurrently with our strategic visioning process, we will develop a long-term campus plan to fulfill that vision and to ensure that we establish the living, working, and learning environments needed for our staff, students, and faculty in the days and decades to come. I encourage you, all of you, whether you're here or watching online, to participate in creating this vision of ours together. Who we are, what we stand for, and where we are going as a great public university. In conclusion, well, go for it. <laughs> I am convinced, if you couldn't notice, that the brightest days for the University of Michigan lie ahead. And I'm certain that by constantly discovering, learning, connecting, aspiring, we can transform our world just as we have for 200 years. This is our time to renew this rise, this commitment. This is our moment to dream bold dreams. So let us begin today and continue that process. Let us set free our full power and potential as one of the world's great universities. Let us come together like never before to address the world's most pressing challenges, live our best traditions as a university, and create a future beyond our dreams. Together, we can. Thank you, and go blue.
forgot something. You guys ready? You guys ready? By the way, I want you to say something. In this wonderful inaugura inaugural cello ensemble, let's hear it for them, by the way. There is one special person who revived my ability to play the cello from near death. And that is a professor of cello at CCM at the University of Cincinnati and a member of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear, let's hear it for Alan Rafter. Alan, please stand. Alan. And once again, uh, thank you to the inaugural cello ensemble. You've been fantastic and also to the, to the singer. And I hope I don't mess it up. You guys ready? Can we get another round of applause for the inaugural cello choir? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noah Zimmerman, and I serve as the president of Central Student Government. On behalf of the leaders of the student governments of the three campuses and the graduate students of Ann Arbor, we'll now present President Ono with a commemorative gift. I'm joined by TJ Brooks, the president of UM Flint Student Government, Claire Liu, president of Rackham Student Government, and Dorina Maddy, president of UM Dearborn Student Government. <laughs> president Ono, we represent a combined student body that is 60,000 strong. On behalf of all Michigan students, together with the faculty and staff, we are proud to present you with a gift that symbolizes our confidence in your leadership. Here is a glass plaque inscribed with a quote from Aristotle. Aristotle is the father of Western logic and the father of higher education as we know it today. It reads, educating the mind without an education of the soul is no education at all. Michigan exemplifies the holistic education of heart and mind. For more than 200 years, our university has lived up to Aristotle's edict. We know under your leadership, the power and purpose of this institution will go stronger to educate our hearts as well as our minds, making enlightened citizens of us all. 
In addition to this plaque, we have a plan to inscribe this quote and inscription printed on the walls of all three campuses. To show our uni unity as one university and the mission you bring, President Ono, on behalf of the student body of the three campuses of the University of Michigan, please accept this token of our appreciation for your service to our beloved university. We are thrilled you're here, and we know we're in very good hands. Thank you. Let's hear it for our great students. This great event is not yet over. It's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Hubbard, our Vice Chair of the University of Michigan Board of Regents. Well, thank you, Provost McCauley. I just want to take a second to one more time acknowledge the search committee who helped bring us to this point today. So many of you have been here, the uh, large presidential search committee and active in the festivities today. And Regent Denise Illich and I co-chaired that. And we couldn't be happier with the result, could we? <laughs> so congratulations again, President Ono. So to all of those of you here uh, in the auditorium and those watching it on the live stream, thank you for participating in the installation of our 15th president, Dr. Santa J. Ono. It's been a joy to officially honor him and welcome him to his family, his family to our Michigan community. We'll continue our festivities with an informal reception on the second floor of the Michigan League. The Michigan League is just to your left as you leave the building. So please join us there at the conclusion of this event. And before we leave, it's a Michigan tradition to end ceremonial events with the singing of our alma mater, the yellow and blue. The words are printed on the back of your program. So at the conclusion of the song, please remain at your seats while the platform party leads the recessional from the auditorium. And now I ask you to please stand, if you're able, and sing the alma mater, the yellow and blue. Oh, okay. 